Per the gross income definition, we are now going to be looking at received by or accrued to. So received by or accrued to, what does it mean? What does it mean when they say in the gross income definition that an amount has been received by you? So, for example, let's say you are over here. Your friend comes to you, friend A, and says to you, I bought things from friend B. friend B, who lives in a different town, and now I want to pay him. You are planning to go and visit friend B in other towns. So friend A says to you, can you please take this money, this hundred rands that I owe friend B, please take it to friend B and then go and pay it to friend B. Now, from a tax perspective, you have received money Right, if I quickly just take you to the gross income definition. During this year of assessment, you've received cash, you are a resident, and for now, just assume it's not capital nature. So that means, just by your friend giving you money to give to someone else, you should potentially include it in your gross income. And then when you pay to friend B, you have to then consider if it's, a, if it's a deduction or something like that. Now guys, that is obviously something if you think about it that hasn't happened why doesn't it happen let's see what received by means so received by means there was a court case that said received by means that you've received it on his own behalf and for his own benefit that's the Gelden Hayes case so it says you when you received that hundred rands did you receive it for your own benefit no you didn't you received it from friend A just to go and give to friend B. So whose benefit is it? Whose money is it? It's friend B's. You don't get any benefit from it. So because of that, you have not received it in terms of the gross income definition. Now, friend A might say to you, listen, you need to pay this 100 rands to friend B, but because you're doing me a favor, I'm going to pay you 10 rands to do that. Now, you've received a total of 110 rands. The 100 rands, is it for your own benefit? No. The 10 rands, is it for your own benefit? Yes. So, gross income in this case will be the 10 rands that friend A paid you for your services rendered. Okay, so that's what it means if you've received it for your own benefit. So, let's talk about this. A deposit. What happens if you receive a deposit? Now, a lot of you have encountered this, and if you haven't, right? Let's say you go to a shop, and you buy a bottle <laughs> of Coke. This is the new design. When you see it in the stores, remember, you saw it first year. Right, so you buy, go and buy a glass bottle. This is a glass bottle of Coke. And you pay, obviously, guys, this is not just random amounts, five, 15 rands for it. Now the shop says to you, listen, if you bring the bottle back, right, if you bring the bottle back, we will pay you five rands for that. So basically, what does that mean? It means when this person sells this bottle of Coke, five rands of that is considered a deposit and ten rands is considered a sale. Now if the person never ever comes and brings the bottle back then obviously you get to keep the 5 rand. So now the question is when you receive this 15 rands as gross income or as income, how much is gross income? Is it the full 15 rands? Is it just 5 rands? Is it just 10 rands? What is the answer? Now there was a case, the Pyatt's case. Now Pyatt's go and look whenever you go to the store and you look at biscuits those ones that you get in tins and bags and things like that, very often parts you'll still see they're still around. They're a big, big company, they make biscuits and cookies and things like that. Now, what Pirates did is during the World War, First World War, they basically sold tins, uh, biscuits and tins, but tin was very hard to come by because of the war. So what they would say to people is, if you bring the tin back in a good condition, then we'll pay you a deposit. So basically, they had the little cookie tin like this, right with the little biscuits in it so people ate the biscuits and then they had this tin so assume they sold it for 15 rands 
Back then in World War time, that would have been the craziest expensive tin of biscuits, but okay, 15 rands. And they said that same situation. 5 rands is the deposit, and 10 rands is the sale. So this went to court because Pyatt said only the 10 rands should be a sale, the 5 rands is the deposit. And what the court said, the court said, the only way in which that can be the case is when you receive this money, this 15 rands, is that you immediately take that 5 rands out completely away from the rest of your money and put it in its own separate bank or trust account. So you need to keep it completely separate from your money. You can't mix it with your money and say, well, I've actually got 15 rand. If the person comes back, say, I have to pay it out. You can't do that. You have to say from the start, I've got two bank accounts. One and two. Bank account one will have my 10 rands in it and bank account two will have my five rands deposit in it. Then, if you keep that separately, it won't be taxed as gross income until you move it and move it into your bank account. Okay, so that's the Pyatt case. So if you receive it and you keep it with your receiving money, you will pay tax on it. So what happens if you do something illegal? You start selling cocaine to people and they pay you a thousand rands for the cocaine that you sold them. Will that thousand rands then be gross income for you as the drug dealer? Now, basically, what we've seen in court cases, and we'll discuss in a second, they've said that we need to look at your intention when you receive that thousand rands. Was your intention to receive it for your own benefit? If the answer is yes, then the amount will be included in your gross income. If the answer is no, then the amount is not included in your gross income. Now, if you sell cocaine and you get a thousand rands, you're selling cocaine to get a thousand rands. So your intention is definitely to get the thousand rands for yourself. So you must be taxed on it. I'm pointing it out to you, I'm just mentioning it. Years ago, uh, up until a couple of years ago, South Africa's view on it was different, and we followed a court case in, from Zimbabwe, which said no. When, when, um, or let me explain like this. When there's a thief, a thief steal comes into your house. Let's use this as an example. It works better for all this. A thief comes into your house and he steals a thousand rands from you. That thousand rands that the thief stole, is it gross income for the thief? Now, I've said to you, we look at the intention. So the intention of the thief is, yes, he wants to receive the thousand rands from himself, so it is gross income. What I was saying is, up until a couple of years ago, we followed a court case from Zimbabwe that said, that thief cannot be taxed on the thousand rands because the owner of the money, so me or you, the victim, did not intend to give it to the thief. So they, they looked at the intention of the person who is giving the money. And we followed that same court case until a couple of years ago, when the MP Finance Group court case took place. Now the MP Finance Group court case, Mariki Prinsler, just a little bit of background, I, I, I always give a little bit of background because this was pretty close to home for me. Because I grew up in a small town um, called Vereniging, the MP Finance Group was Mariki Prinsler's finance group. She, um, in a neighboring town called Van der Bijl Park, she had started the pyramid scheme. And what she did, so obviously our pyramid scheme works is there's one person that says to two people over here, listen, um, you can each give me a hundred rands, and then if you get three people to also give a hundred rands, then you'll get 250 rands back. And, they, and then these three people over here, they must do the same. So you all know what a pyramid scheme is. There's no business, it's just collecting money from other people and giving it to people that came first. That's basically what it is. It's never a good thing. There's no such thing as free money. So, the MP Finance Group case. This woman and her family went and they basically had this pyramid scheme in front of Bell Park and obviously in the whole of that area, so my city as well. Lots of people, pinch, uh, people on pension, very old people, very poor people, paid money into this pyramid scheme because, you know, there was this promise of getting money back and in the end they lost a lot of money. What also then happened is some of the people did receive money at some point and then they put in extra money so they lost money but those people that received extra money this also went to court and they also had to pay tax on it. So this woman and this company, the MP Finance Group, they received all of this money from different people which is obviously they were at the top. They received all this money. So when it went to court, and the court now found them guilty of having a pyramid scheme and embezzling money and taking money from people, 
the source then came and said, we want to tax you on the money that you received. And she said, no, I can't because it's illegal activities and I can't and so on. So what the courts then said, no, this is where they decided. If you intended, you intended to receive that money for your own benefit, you'll be taxed on it. That's why it now happens. Then, there was also the Delagoa Bay Cigarette Company case, which also says that, listen, if you do an act, if you do something, an activity which is illegal or immoral, then you will still have to include it in gross income. Ultra-virus, what does that mean? Can you remember? Ultra-virus is, let's say there's a company, right, so I'm just putting a little structure, there's a company, and this company um, buys plus sells shoes. And one of the directors is approached by someone that says, listen, let's cut a deal. I'm going to sell you some cars, and then you have to sell it through the company. Now, that's, this director is not authorized to enter into that agreement, but he enters into that agreement. Right. This person who enters into the agreement cannot be, won't be jeopardized. This guy acted ultra-virus. So this will still be considered legal. Okay. They obviously, then the company can take action against them, but it's still considered legal. So the Delagoa Bay cigarette company case, just quickly, what basically happened is it was a company that sold packs of cigarette, cigarettes, but they sold them, let's say the usual price was 10 rands, they sold them for um, 18 rands, let's say. And they took all that extra money and they put it into a fund and they said to people, we're going to have a lucky draw. And then whoever has, wins the lucky draw can get that, all of the money, the extra money we collected. So it's like a lottery. And basically what happened, it was an illegal lottery. So they then, saw said, we want to tax you on 18 rands. They said, no, only on the 10 rands, because the 8 rands was illegal. And that is also where um, the court cases said, listen, even if it's illegal, you can still be taxed on it. Now, what does accrued to mean? Because remember, the gross income definition says received by or accrued to. So what does accrued to mean? Accrued to means... You haven't received it yet, but you have become entitled to it. So, there was a court case, the people's stall case, it says, accrued to means a purchase is entitled to an amount, even if it is not yet received. Then you'll be accrued to. So, what does it mean? So, let's say, for example, X Limited sells goods to Mr. A on credit. Mr. A will only pay in two years. Okay, so X Limited sells something today and only in two years time will Mr. A pay for it. Today, X Limited becomes entitled to that money. Right? So that it's just a, uh, it's just a, basically they've got a debtor here. I'm not saying if they, if they have an agreement that says Mr. A cannot pay until two years have passed and some condition is made, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this is a normal sale. Right, so if you are entitled to it. Because there was the Moy case, which said you must be unconditionally entitled to it. So it means there must be no amount or condition attached to it. Okay, so if I say to you, X Limited sells goods to Mr. A, and he says, Listen, Mr. A, these goods that I've sold you, I want you to use it for two years. If it, if it meets certain conditions, then after two years, you need to pay me. If it doesn't meet those requirements and conditions, then you don't have to pay me. If I say something like that, it's different. Then the condition is Mr. A must use it for two years. So only after two years have passed will the conditions be met. Alright, then, this is a popular principle. Let's say that you have a shop, right, and you sell things to the public, and today you made 10,000 rands. At the end of the day, You've got only cash, so 10,000 rands in cash. At the end of the day, a thief comes into the shop. Right? Because <laughs> thieves wear, I don't know, bandana, I suppose. The thief comes into the shop and he waves a gun into your face and he says, if you don't give me that 10,000 rands in cash, I'm going to shoot you. So they give him the 10,000 rands in cash, the thief runs away with it. So now you have null in your cash register. Should you be taxed, should you include that 10,000 rands in your gross income? The Witwaters Rand Association of Racing Clubs case said, if an amount has been received by you, or it has accrued to you, and it is then disposed of afterwards, so this was being received by us, but it was disposed of afterwards by this thief, that amount will still be included in your gross income. So you will still have to go and do a tax calculation and say sales, 10,000 rands. Now that seems obviously unfair. It's not unfair. The reason for it is 
This is then a theft that have taken place. So there will be a deduction for the theft will be allowed. So it should still be null. But I want you to understand this is an important concept. Although the answer is null, you can't just have said sales over there is null. You can't. You have to apply the different sections because sales will be a section 1 definition that you're applying and theft will be a section 11 deduction, general deduction formula. So why am I saying this to you? It's important for you to understand that yes, don't just look at the net effect. I know that's what we want to do quite often as accountants, we want to just look at the net effect, but you can't. You have to use it like a lawyer and say yes, it is applicable in terms of section 1, but then in terms of section 11, this happens. So please remember guys, don't just look at the net effect and discuss the net effect and just say there's no gross income, because that's wrong. There is gross income. Right, and then discounting of amounts. What happens if you should receive an amount in the future? So um, today, year one, you make a sale and in year five they will pay you 10,000 rands. Should you then discount it to year one because time value of money? The answer is no. You'll include the 10,000 rands. We don't really do discounting of amounts in tax.